Hello, good morning, and welcome to the third breakfast brought to you live from, um, uh, from Mangahung, the ANC's 53rd elective national conference. This is the third breakfast where we will be discussing key policy and economic issues. Um, the breakfasts are being hosted by the Progressive Business Forum. And today we have as our guest Minister for Economic Development, Ibrahim Patel. But first, to get a perspective from business, we are joined by Siswe Ngedan. He is the chief economist of FNB. Over to Mr. Nidana. To the Minister of Economic Development, uh, the Honorable Ibrahim Patel, honorable dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you this morning. In the five years to 1994, the South African economy averaged a GDP growth rate of only 0.2%, while our inflation rate average 12.4%. The economy inherited by the ANC government was characterized by weak growth and high inflation. Furthermore, it was highly indebted with a government debt to GDP, in other words, a government debt burden running close to 50%. As a result, the cost of debt service was one of the highest expenditure items in the budget, robbing other much more important expenditure items such as healthcare, education, and housing. The attainment of political stability through the successful transition to a democratic dispensation in 1994 and the successful implementation of several macroeconomic stabilization policies such as gear and inflation targeting, amongst others, were successful in stabilizing the, the SA economy, such that by 2007, our budget deficits had been eliminated, our government debt to GDP ratio had halved to almost 20% of GDP, and in the five years to 2008, our growth averaged just under 5%, and inflation was largely kept contained within the 3 to 6% inflation target ban. However, despite all this initial success, of the 33 million South Africans aged between 15 and 64, in other words, our working age population, only 13.7 only million people are employed. This is a dismal labor absorption ratio of only 42%. In countries of similar development, that ratio stands closer to 60%. In other words, if we could become like Philippines or Brazil, our employment ratio or labor absorption ratio would possibly eliminate uh, our, our, our unemployment rate. What we have learned over the last 20 years is that political stability and macroeconomic stability are necessary but are not sufficient conditions for labor absorptive economic growth. One of the main policy discussions, if not the main policy discussion of the current conference, should be how do we take advantage of the macro and the political stability attained over the last 20 years to begin to embark on a more labor absorptive uh, growth path. In our view, um, South Africa has undergone both political and macroeconomic stability, which we feel are two thirds of a policy tripod. The missing link are the supply side or microeconomic reforms that could place us on a more labor absorptive path. We are of the view that policy measures such as the new development plan and the new growth path would be a, right, a step in the right direction in placing us upon that path. We wish the minister and our political leadership all the best of luck as they deliberate on how to place us on that path. Thank you. That was, of, that was, of course, Mr. Sizwe Ngedlane. He, was the, he is, rather, the chief economist of FNB. Our guest, like I said earlier, is now the um, Economic Development Minister, Mr. Ibrahim Patel. He will be addressing us on the new growth path, which is the blueprint that his department has developed within the context of the African National Congress's commitment to economic development. He will also be touching on the, um, how the plan fits in, or the path fits in with the development plan, and, of course, also take us through government's uh, plans around infrastructure rollout. Mr. Ibrahim Patel. Uh, Karima, uh, representatives of business and professional organizations, members of the diplomatic corps, listeners, colleagues. Over the past few days, this conference of the African National Congress has received 
a number of reports on aspects of economic policy and, crucially, of implementation. We have grappled, and in commissions today, we will continue to grapple with a transformation problematic. How to achieve our goals, how to achieve them effectively and in a socially efficient manner. These are clearly central challenges. Challenges to the ruling party, challenges to all of us as South Africans. I want to use the opportunity to share with you some of the reasons why this challenge is so crucial and to illustrate with a few examples how government is going about addressing these challenges. To start off with, we've got to do some hard thinking about development and transformation, not just about growth. Growth is important, it's vital, it's a necessary condition for achieving our goals. But it's not sufficient. The main reason for that is that the vast majority of our people need to benefit from growth. We need to have a more diversified economy that can generate employment on a large scale. But when we look at the pattern of our growth, we're not achieving that. We're not achieving that uh, to the scale that we need. Consider that today the median income for formal sector workers is about 3,000 rand a month. For domestic and informal workers, it's about half of that. So we can't simply measure the physical output of the economy without also looking at whether those benefits are fairly distributed. And fair distribution starts with people having a job. Employment is at the absolute center of economic inclusion. It's because growth has historically been inequitable, deeply inequitable during the apartheid years, that the ANC called for a new, more equitable growth path. None of us, not businesses, not workers, not the unemployed, can prosper if we do not build an economy that is more equitable and more inclusive. That really is our central challenge. That, if you want to know, is the task of this generation. The injustices that have been deeply rooted in the economy lay the basis for divisions and conflict in our communities, in workplaces, in wherever policy is expressed or debated. We've been through a difficult period over the last few months, as that reality has played itself out in our workplaces. It's for this reason that the ANC has said that political democracy is only the first step towards overcoming the legacy of our history. We need to do more. We must overcome the systemic exclusion of millions of our people from economic opportunities. Over the past 18 years, uh, we've underscored the importance of more equitable growth. Since 1994, if you reflect on this, South Africa has grown at virtually the same uh, as that of other middle-income countries if we exclude China from it. Before 1994, growth was averaging for that decade or so about 1.6%. During the democratic era, including <clears throat> a global economic crisis, uh, growth virtually doubled to an average of just over 3%. So we've not done worse than the average of middle-income developing countries by the yardstick of economic growth. We've not done worse. Of course, you've got to take China uh, out because the very fast, very significant growth of China uh, certainly lifts that average. But employment, as the, the economist from FNB has said, remains far lower than most other countries, with only two out of five adults uh, earning an income. Inequality remains among the worst in the world. And as a result, growth has not healed the divisions and the wounds left by apartheid. The ANC has long recognized that placing our country on a new growth path requires collaboration between the business community and other sectors of the society with the state. None of us can afford to pursue narrow self-interest, uh, certainly not at this time. It would only reproduce the un unsustainable divisions that we've inherited from our past. So, 
we ask some hard questions. What must we do to achieve more sustainable prosperity? What is the extra effort we need to build a South Africa where our children also prosper? What kind of society do we want to live in 20 years from now? And how can we help to achieve it? These questions go to the heart of what the National Development Plan attempts to do. And that plan then sets an overarching vision that we can see as the common uh, roadmap of where South Africa is moving to. The new growth path is the economic strategy for driving jobs and growth. I can point to a few interventions uh, by the ANC government uh, to address the kind of questions that the National Development Plan is asking and that is beginning to affect our policy framework. First, they include work on what we call our jobs drivers. Areas of the economy, areas of uh, the uh, context within which the economy operates that we believe provides opportunity for significant jobs growth. But they also include our work on infrastructure, on industrial funding, on small business development, on driving industrialization using public policy measures. And in uh, this introductory comments, I'd like to refer to each of these briefly. First, in the new growth path, we've identified six major jobs drivers. They include infrastructure development, to which I will return. But they also begin to look at what do we have that can drive job creation and growth. And critical in that is mining and beneficiation. It's agriculture and agro-processing. It's the manufacturing industry and some great stories about uh, manufacturing. It's the green economy. And it's certain high-level business services, which includes tourism and the creative sectors. Of course, we are reorienting our work to the enormous opportunities of our continent. And we're deepening our economic relationships uh, and expanding it with fast-growing economies in the global south, principally our partners in BRICS, whilst retaining our valued relationships with the developed world. On infrastructure, government has developed a 20-year project pipeline, something that is a multi-administration vision coordinated through 18 strategic integrated projects. They embrace economic and social infrastructure, covering water, energy, rail, roads, and ports, as well as sanitation, healthcare, school build, uh, and the development and expansion of universities. Of course, we're in the 21st century, so information and communication technologies are vital. And so the National Broadband Rollout Plan is a critical element of national infrastructure uh, planning. On industrial funding, we're repositioning the Industrial Development Corporation. It has set aside some 102 billion rand uh, to finance uh, job-creating job-rich economic activities, investments in the core new growth path sectors. To illustrate uh, this uh, and, and the focus on job creation, on shifting the economy, <clears throat> as the new growth path calls, to a more labor-absorbing trajectory, the IDC has created a facility of prime less 3% for key commercial projects that have a above average employment impact. It has also speeded up its approval times. One of the challenges is not just availability of funding, but getting our public institutions working smarter and faster. On small business development, we've consolidated the different national funding agencies into one national funding small business uh, agency, the Small Enterprise Financing Agency, CIFA. We've expanded its budget, so it's given, uh, given it more money. Uh, it has two billion rand available immediately. And we're now looking to improve the performance of its loan book, reduce the cost of its loan, and expand its footprint. Get small business funding into more townships, into more villages, tap into the uh, enormous creativity and entrepreneurial energy that South Africans have, but that it's not connected currently uh, with uh, financial markets. 
on industrialization, in addition to industrial funding and small business development, we're also using procurement and state spending to support growth and development of South African industry. We've worked with the competition and trade uh, authorities to help boost industrial performance and jobs. And we've used incentives administered via government departments to attract new investments. Let me give an example of that. Uh, earlier this year, I went to, to launch uh, the new three series BMW facility uh, in uh, Gauteng, in Roslyn. And BMW had invested an additional 2.2 billion rand off the back of its confidence in the South African economy and the kind of measures that the state had put in place for the expansion of the auto sector and its components. They increased the number of units fairly significantly to 90,000 units, from about just over 60,000 units, a significant scale up of production, most of which are intended for uh, export markets. And in the process, BMW itself will create 600 jobs. And it will be deepening its uh, component procurement from South African companies or companies based here. One example, and they replicate it across a number of fronts of the kind of successes we're beginning to have in parts of manufacturing. Partnerships matter. Specifically, we need to draw on the private sector expertise in planning and the implementation of major projects, in developing sustainable financial mechanisms, so we'll be talking to the banks, and providing input so that we create employment and deepen industrialization on scale. Above all, we must ensure that our new infrastructure crowds in productive investment, from mining to agriculture to manufacturing to value-added services, so that we generate more employment and incomes for our people. Let me give you uh, an example of how public investment in infrastructure can drive economic development. We're expanding rail, electricity, and water supply in Limpopo and parts of Mpumalanga on, a, on scale, specifically to facilitate investment in mining of chromium, of coal, of platinum, and of palladium. But as we do that, as we unlock that mineral opportunity through infrastructure planning, we also recognize there will be an enormous concentration of people in Lepalali. It will become a major urban growth area. It can become it like the past, unplanned, reproducing the spatial divisions of our sad history, or it can be an opportunity for us to plan the first proper post-apartheid uh, post South African city. That's the challenge that uh, we've taken up in the infrastructure plan. In turn, the investment in Limpopo and in Mpumalanga will boost overall growth and generate employment. Yes, for construction workers, if you take a helicopter and you fly above uh, Medupi at the moment, you'll see one of the largest construction sites in the world, the biggest construction site on the African continent, some uh, 16,000 people employed there. So in all of these projects, government can provide a basis for productive investment. But we need more than that. We need business people from the huge mining houses to the smallest rural entrepreneurs to think outside the box, to seize the new opportunities we are creating to help us build our future together. Thank you. We, we say a big thank you, of course, there to Economic Development Minister Ibrahim Patel. Minister, let me get straight into um, some of the issues that you've raised. You, in your conclusion, spoke about the fact that you are inviting business to come on board with government as a partner. In um, the last few months, there's been quite a lot of criticism from the sector around um, policy uncertainty, given the context of the ANC's um, elective conference, where very critical issues are being discussed. Um, from your assessment so far, the discussions that are certainly happening in the commissions, is business likely to get that certainty when, um, you know, the conference ends on Thursday? Uh, Karima, I think uh, business will get that certainty. But I'd like to start by saying that one of the fundamental attractions of South Africa is that it's a democracy. This is not a country where you need to be worried that uh, in a few months' time the army may take over. Uh, or you may have uh, the emergence of uh, a dictator. We govern by rule of law. We have a functioning democracy. 
We have an openness uh, to our political system that few countries in the world can match. But with that comes something very important, that public policy is debated in this country. Public policy is not an issue in smoke-filled rooms. It is a societal matter. And when it is something that is as broad and as open as you see it in this country, of course, it's sometimes noisy. On occasion, it's messy. But it's the democratic process in which ideas and interests surface. And they mediate it through the disciplined discussions of our political system, of our parliamentary system, of our judiciary. That is the attraction we hold. Let me come in here, Minister. You, of course, um, when you came into government, uh, wore another hat. You came from the Labour Federation, COSATU. And, of course, COSATU is in an alliance with the African National Congress. And there's an inherent push-pull tension around discussions on what economic policy would be best suited to deal with some of the intractable challenges uh, that South Africa face. Um, having been in government since 2009, as someone who's come from unions um, and often coming under, under fire from your colleagues. Um, uh, Kusatu hasn't um, uh, been, um, you know, they, they haven't minced their words about the, what they think are the shortcomings of your new growth path. What has been your experience as a trade unionist coming into government um, and having to get to grips with the fact that policy is a contested issue and that it's a question of give and take? I'd say one of my reflections is how important implementation is. Yes, policy and the contestation of policy is vital. But the ANC government, in a number of administrations, has had policy positions that speak powerfully to the needs of ordinary South Africans, to job creation, to the needs of the poor. Our big challenge is to get the state to work efficiently and effectively, to make sure that the belt between policy and uh, delivery, which is your implementation systems, actually work. That's the one reflection. I think the other one also is that in a society, not only with the legacies of the past in our racialized systems, but also with enormous poverty and inequality, there will always be tension in the body politic. You take the United States or Germany or the UK, these are developed countries that have had a long history of grappling with their challenges. Their politics still remain very robust. So we must expect the same. The trade union movement has to represent the interests of its members. Government takes a larger view. We've got to balance many, many different uh, concerns. But we have to ensure that in balancing that, we do address the needs of the core constituency which is South Africa's majority. And that means that there's got to be visible empowerment in the economy. There's got to be skills development solidly, strongly. And uh, recently, uh, last year, we, we signed a national skills accord with the trade unions and with the business community in which we set some targets. And we're delighted we're making solid progress in achieving those targets. But it means also, above all, partnerships, getting business and labor to work on uh, uh, rethinking some of the industrial relations models. And there's something very interesting that's happened post-Americana, um, uh, and that is getting the trade unions and the business uh, community, particularly in the platinum sector, to say, what is our social plan? There's been a growth plan to, to date, a uh, vast expansion of platinum uh, off the back of the world's biggest reserves in this country. But we've not done enough thinking about a human settlements plan, how housing and community development, as well as the social needs of workers in their communities are addressed. It's bringing that together. That's one of the things that I think, coming from a trade union background, that uh, I've seen as a gap. And that we're now working closely with uh, business and labor, we're beginning to address that gap. But the Marikana um, experience has also put that social compact under strain. Uh, in fact, many people will, uh, have suggested that the way in which it's formulated is not necessarily geared to dealing with some of the, the changes you know, in, the, in the economy and also in the, uh, the work environment. Would you say that South Africa's uh, social compact between labor, business, and government and the community is taking strain? And if so, how would it need 
need to be tweaked to address the kind of crises that we see in the economy and also some of the social questions that, that, that um, comes with that. For example, uh, government has been quite um, strong in its criticism of some of the mining companies for not coming to the party um, you know, in terms of, of taking care of the social questions around worker accommodation. But on the other hand, business often say municipalities in certain communities, particularly in the northwest, are dysfunctional. Um, 26 municipalities were placed, for example, under administration. And you have a sense that people are passing the buck. How do you get people to actually take responsibility um, you know, in terms of that social accord? Uh, well, let me start with the taking of responsibility. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's very clear that we've had a significant shifting of, uh, of responsibility for the crisis between the different players. And the first thing we did, in October, the president convened a meeting of uh, uh, business, labor, and community leaders, and he said, we've got to fix this together. And the most extraordinary thing happened. We had a consensus about what needed to, to take place that was developed within two or three days. We had immediate practical action by everybody. And we saw examples of trade union leaders going to mining communities and making a call consistent with the national consensus for workers to return to work whilst recognizing that the underlying grievances needed to be resolved. And business similarly said, we've heard these grievances and we accept we need to do something about it and we need to, to move quite fast. So what we did after that meeting, we've convened now the mayors of the districts that are affected, uh, where there are large mining communities, sat them down with uh, the business representatives and we're hoping that they can move quite rapidly in developing what is called in the, in the uh, social pact a, a new partnership, one in which we bring the money that is available in the public sector and in the mining communities together. But you know, uh, Karima, what this does raise though, it goes to deeper questions. We can, we can fix the short-term challenges, but the Marikana crisis has put the spotlight on the migrant labor system. So it comes back to some of the deeper issues about our political economy. And those are the things that we've got to get dialogue to focus on. So I think we, we've laid a good basis last year. We've begun to develop a, an accord on skills, on the green economy, on localization. We've got to move further now into, we've got to be bolder about the kind of areas that business, labor, government, and communities have to grasp and grapple. Above all, we've got to deal with jobs, more jobs, but also the quality of jobs, better jobs. Mm -hmm. That lies at the heart of really getting the country going. Mm -hmm. Minister, my final question before we go to break. There's been a lot of talk that your new growth path um, is not necessarily um, consistent with the National Development Plan. Several government ministers have been here speaking about areas of convergence. Quickly, what are the areas of, of convergence in the plan and the growth path, and where are the areas of significant difference? Well, let me start with <clears throat> saying that I think that the new growth path and the National Development Plan fit well together, but not by accident. When the National Planning Commission began working on the National Development Plan, it had the benefit of the new growth path and engagement and discussion on the new growth path. So we, we see the new growth path as really, in a sense, uh, an economic strategy that gives effect to the National Development Plan. Some convergence, some key convergence, the starting points of both are, are the same. That we, we're in a new, uncertain, and potentially uh, very helpful period globally. The global south represents a, an opportunity for South Africa to grow fast. Uh, we've got to address climate change. The African continent is a significant uh, opportunity for growth and for development. Infra infrastructure matters. We've got to get a more jobs-rich growth. Those are the underlying themes that run through both the overarching vision as well as the economic strategy. On uh, areas of divergence, I think it would be on small detail, uh, the kind of day-to-day -day things that government departments do, which by the, the nature of government, you'll find uh, as we implement, uh, those are 
uh, the things that cabinets and economic clusters deal with. So I think on the broad vision, it's going in the same direction, and it puts both of them put jobs at the absolute center of what we want to achieve. Minister, we are, of course, going to take questions from the business community, but we have to take a short break. We're taking a short break now, but when we return, we will be taking questions from a series of business leaders who are joining us in the special live broadcast from the ANC's 53rd elective conference. Do stay tuned.